Okay, we're going to start in verse 10 of John chapter 10. It says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own a sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of his fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may be take that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Thank you. Well, I have entitled this message, A Shepherd's Life. A Shepherd's Life. And I'm sitting here looking at um, my notes and seeing how big the letters are. And I was just noticing Keith's Bible is like this big, right? It's one of those pocket-sized Bible, which means that the writing is like microscopic. Oh, to have young eyes again, man, I gotta, I gotta, if they, if I could get an iPad that was like this big, I would probably buy it because it would be easier to read, but okay, a shepherd's life. We are um, still talking in context. We're still talking to the, the Pharisees, right? They're still talking to the crowd right there that Jesus has been talking to about sheep, good shepherds, bad shepherds, um, salvation, basically, and how to get salvation. And if you remember, Jesus started contrasting himself with the, uh, the Pharisees or the, the Jewish leaders of the church right there. He started contrasting themselves with him. And in contrasting himself with them he starts calling them robbers and thieves so jesus is is you know i'm sure he was being very gentle about it but just the fact that he's calling these spiritual leaders robbers and thieves is probably going to make their temperature rise a little bit but it was true they were robbers and thieves they they were stealing from the people we know that right? They were stealing from the church. We know that. They were trying to steal, in all actuality, trying to steal glory from God, right? So they were definitely robbers and thieves because they wanted to elevate themselves. Jesus says that these were the ones that came over the wall. Remember, we talked about the sheepfold and all the sheep are inside the fold and there's only one way in and there's only one way out and that is Christ. And these are the ones that came over the wall and they don't belong there. They don't belong there at all. So that's where we are. And this morning, we're going to pull out um, five points that Jesus basically declares in this section five points that jesus is going to make about himself in contrast to these spiritual leaders and i, I really like um this discourse 
right here in this section. The, the discourse that's going on that Jesus is actually talking to these Pharisees, this is Jesus teaching about Jesus, right? So if you want to understand who Jesus Christ is, this is Jesus talking about himself. Jesus is expositing his very own gospel and his very own purpose here on earth. And I, I, I love that. Jesus is going to preach on, basically, a shepherd's life. This is Jesus preaching about himself. He is, in his own words, telling us who he is. In Ezekiel, um, God had a few things to say about these same Pharisees that Jesus is talking to, right? The same, same crowd. There we go. <laughs> Ezekiel 34 says, thus says the Lord God, woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. That sounds like bad shepherding. That sounds like very bad shepherding. And this is the people that Jesus is talking to. This is the people that Jesus is comparing to. Well, in Ezekiel here, God goes on and scolds them, right? scolds them and, and tells them what they're doing for not helping the sick, not helping the injured, um, for dominating and for spiritually abusing the sheep. And you know, all the things that we're talking about in Israel that J Jesus or that God is scolding these shepherds for, this is what Jesus is scolding basically the same crowd in front of him different time zones, different times, but it's the same. They, nothing has changed, right? The same people that we looked at when they were um, abusing the blind guy that Jesus healed, right? Spiritually abusing him, bully pulpit stuff. I mean, threatening his family. You can't come to church here anymore if you, all sorts of stuff, right? Strong arming. Jesus now is going to continue to contrast himself with those shepherds that are in charge of God's sheep at this time. Well, if you continue down in Ezekiel, after, after the woeing, after Jesus is, is scolding these people, after that, the super bad shepherds get to hear some other things. And God talks about restoring the lost. He talks about healing up the beaten and the abused sheep. He talks about how he, God, is the good shepherd, right? How God is the ultimate shepherd. If we skip down to um, verses 11 in Ezekiel, he says, Behold, I myself, this is God talking. Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places which they were scattered. See, God is the ultimate shepherd. He is the ultimate owner of the sheep. He owns the sheep. So it means he's the ultimate good shepherd. We are his sheep. Israel, what he's talking about here, is his sheep. And we know this because all throughout the Bible, God refers to those who believe and trust in his name as his sheep, right? God is the good shepherd that's in charge. But then he continues on and he says, I, I, they're, these are my sheep. I own them, I am the good shepherd, but I'm going to appoint a once and for all ruling shepherd, okay, 
over the sheep that I own. These are my sheep. I'm God. I am the good shepherd. I am going to appoint somebody over these sheep. So that's where we find the first thing that we're looking at. Not one of the five, but the basis for the five points that we're going to pull out is the promise of God, the good shepherd. In Ezekiel, um, continuing on, 34, verses 23 to 34, he says, Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. That's like, that's like the stamp uh, over the judge's gavel. Kaboom. I have spoken. It is decreed. God is promising that this new shepherd, the shepherd that's going to be over everybody, is David. And we kind of look at that and we go, wait a minute. Didn't David die <laughs> a long time ago before Ezekiel, this, this Ezekiel prophecy? God isn't talking about David, King David. He's talking about the Messiah. This is a prophetic announcement of the Messiah, the one shepherd that God will appoint over his sheep. This is the Messiah. And we're going to see that Jesus now is the good shepherd. Jesus declares I am, right? We, we, a few weeks ago, a month ago, we went through all of the I am statements of Jesus, right? And we understand that when Jesus says, I am, and then gives a description, he is claiming a deity or God's title, the name of God. He's claiming that deity. He's claiming that he is the Messiah, He's claiming that he is the savior, all of that. He's claiming that he is the good shepherd that God appoints over all of the sheep. And I love this. The sheep, the sheep have been beaten. They have been bruised. They have been taken advantage of. They have been misdirected. They have been held accountable to things that should they should never have been accountable for as far as law, God's law. They, all sorts of things. The sheep have been left out to starve by themselves as the leaders of the sheep or the shepherds take care of themselves and take from the sheep. In all reality, they have been left totally on their own without an earthly shepherd without an earthly shepherd, right? And isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36? He says, seeing the people, Jesus, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. Those are the people. That's who Jesus was, was coming for. And he he felt compassion on these people. Even though he's talking to the Pharisees, there's a bunch of sheep that are all around him, right? So the so-called shepherds standing in front of Jesus, they were the problem. They were the major problem, right? Because a shepherd's main concern should be the safety and the well-being of the sheep. The safety and well-being of the flock that they're attending, their sheep. Their, their concern should be providing for the sheep. Food, water, protection. Those are, those are a shepherd's primary responsibilities. That's not what they were doing. The shepherd was to love and to care for the sheep. And from the Pharisees down, there was no love. There was no caring. There was looking out for me and myself. They were the problem. And as always, here's the problem. 
As always, Jesus is the solution. You have the problem. Now here comes the solution. Here is Jesus. Based on the promises of God that we just looked at in Ezekiel, based on Jesus' messianic credentials, that's the important thing. That's super important. His messianic credentials, all the prophecies that rest on him that he has fulfilled, that he's going to continue to fulfill, based on his deity, I am. I am, right? He's claiming the deity. Jesus proclaims, and this is our first declaration that we're going to see. The first declaration is the declaration of the good shepherd. And in verse 11 of our text, we read that. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father, father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. And like I suggested a minute ago, this is another one of those great I am statements. Claiming his Godhead. Claiming his oneness with the father the father knows me i know the father claiming his eternality no nobody else could claim that he was forever in existence before <laughs> he declares that he is the sufficient provision for his people because i am means the becoming one right i am the becoming one i I'm the one that provides all that you need. Right here, Jesus is declaring himself to be God. I am God's name and the good shepherd, a reference to God alone. Throughout the Old Testament, the good shepherd was always the reference to God and God alone. Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 79 and 75 says we are God's sheep. All the way back into Genesis, God who has been my shepherd. In Isaiah 40, he or Jehovah, Yahweh, will tend his sheep. In Ezekiel 34, we just read all of the different places where God is the good shepherd. And Jesus says, <laughs> me, that's me. God is the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. If that's not a claim to deity, if that's not a claim to God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, then I don't know what is. Then we're missing the point. He declares right there his, his messianic purpose. And Luke gave us a word, um, word of the day on a Thursday night a long time ago. A seity, Right? The aseity of God. That's, that's another word for you today because if you've forgotten that word, because we don't use it very often, the aseity of God is, means that God is not dependent on anything. God is not dependent on anything. And then when you flip that over, everything other than God is dependent on God. Right? God is not dependent on anything, but the world, us, every living creature, nature, space, the planets, the star, everything else is dependent on God, on the aseity of God. And Jesus says, I am, I am the aseity, <laughs> basically everything. I don't depend on anything. I'm here for you guys. 
I'm here to save you guys. There's nothing that, right? We depend on him. Colossians 1, 16 through 17 says, For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. If that's not a seity, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Everything is dependent on God. Everything. I am. That's what Jesus says here. I am. And that's what starts to get him riled. And he's emphasizing his aseity and his sovereignty. And let me remind you as we're going, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, God is everything and everything depends on God. And yeah, Jesus is God. Remember his audience. <laughs> Not this congregation. Remember his audience that was listening and hearing this. The Jewish leaders are now changing colors at this statement. And it, it's neat when you look at this, the Greek is written, we're not doing a Greek lesson, I promise, but the Greek is written so that the text literally reads, the shepherd, the good one. I like that. The shepherd, the good one. It's setting Christ, the good shepherd, apart from all the other shepherds. It's, it's the word kalos that, that is used that refers to his character above all others. It means superior or choice, noble, right? Or I like this one, better than, right? Go through Hebrews and you're going to find better than on every page pointing to Christ. Christ is better than this, that. Jesus says, I am the shepherd, the good one. Right, man, I just, <laughs> that's, that's, I would say it with way more sarcasm than I'm sure that he says. I, I, yeah, I'm the shepherd, the good one. So that they understand, you guys are a bunch of foolish, you know, whatever. He is the perfect, authentic shepherd in a class by himself, preeminent above all others. And he states this. He's not the shepherd of the month, right? He's not the, you know, one of many. He is the good shepherd. The second declaration that we have that I really love here is the declaration of ownership. The declaration of ownership. He says, I, being the shepherd, you know, the good one, I know my own and my own know me. We hit on this a little bit um, in, the, in the last discussion time when we, I love it. It's hard for me sometimes when we get into these discussions because really you guys steal everything that I'm going to talk about next Sunday as we, you know what I mean? I got to find new things, but kidding. But we hit on this. Um, Jesus personally knows his sheep. Personally knows his sheep, right? That's, that's Luke. That's, that's Deb. That's, that's Brian over there. And the goofy sheep that's behind the pulpit. Yeah, well, that's the foolish dope that I'm trying to confound the wise with. So we'll just be nice to him. But Jesus knows his sheep. He knows us and he calls us. When Jesus calls us, it is our natural created response to pull our face 
out of the grass that we're feeding on, okay, lift our head and say, ooh, that's my shepherd. That's my shepherd. I know him. I hear his voice and then follow him. That's what we're created for. It's unnatural to do anything other than that. Just, it's unnatural. But because we are his, because he chose us, we can respond and we can say, that is my shepherd. And, and I love that because that's a picture of salvation, right? The shepherd calls us individually by name. We hear our shepherd and we naturally recognize he is ours. He owns me. And we naturally follow him, leaving behind the other goats, okay? Kind of helping out, you know, towards the end when the sheep and the goats get separated. When our shepherd calls us, we should leave behind the goats. We leave behind the old dead sheepfold because that's what he's calling them out of. An old dead sheepfold. Following our shepherd now into green pastures and into still waters in provision, in safety. Psalm 95 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, right? And then it goes on. We are his sheep. He owns us. And Jesus is declaring, I am the good shepherd and I own those sheep. I have called those sheep. We belong to him. The third declaration that we see here is the declaration of salvation and provision. And I love this because they're in one sentence together. They're two totally different amazing things, but Jesus puts them together because they, even though they are separate things, they are inseparable. If you understand that they, you cannot separate them, even though they're individual things, salvation and provision in verse nine, we saw that Jesus is the one who leads to salvation. That was, that was last week. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That, that is a good shepherd because that is the shepherd that gives salvation, right? If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. That is a shepherd unto salvation. Because by no other name, by no other shepherd, through no other door, can we receive salvation. That's it. And then, after salvation, after, after he saves us, right? He leads us to provision. That's all part of the deal. That's all part of it. He leads us to provision. All that we need is found in Jesus. All that we need, and that abundantly, he says. It's our misunderstanding of our needs that we kind of get confused with this whole thing. Well, yeah, Lord, I need, I need a bigger truck. Yeah, Lord, I need, you know, more salary. Lord, I need more. No, that's not what we're talking about here. All that we need is found in Christ. It's a spiritual thing. This is a shepherd's life. This is a shepherd's life. To care for the sheep, to nurture them, 
to protect them, to lead them, to lead them out and back in, out to feed, to water, back in to safety, to give them a good life. This is a shepherd's life. Jesus is declaring that this is what his life was devoted to. This is why he came. This is what he was here for. Salvation. Provision. Because that is a shepherd's life. Jesus is sufficient to meet every need we could ever have or think. Remember David in the Psalms, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. Either directly or indirectly, every need is met by our good shepherd. Man, it's, why would we trust anything else besides our good shepherd? Well, we'll jump back here real quick to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, 15 to 16, God says, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. Ah, that's awesome. Those are all the things that Jesus said throughout his ministry. Yeah, that's why I'm here. That whole thing. Right there. All what we need is found in Christ. Jesus goes before us to lead the way. He stays behind us to protect us. He picks us up when we fall. Like last week we saw when we fall into trenches over and over and over. That's our good shepherd pulling us out. He finds us when we stray. He walks alongside us. To encourage us. Even when we can't walk. Even when we can't walk. Our good shepherd carries us. That's what he does. His rod and his staff comfort both in leading. In protection. In safety. In salvation. Correction. All of those things. They're comforting. Every need is met in Christ. I love that. The next declaration is not only the Jewish fold, which is kind of who he's talking to. That's his captive audience right now, talking about that specific fold. He's calling them out of that fold into his fold. And he he declares that he is the shepherd that will save the Gentiles. I like that because that's me. So the declaration to save the Gentiles, we see in verse 16 of our text this morning. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Okay, you guys that I'm calling out of this fold here, this Israel fold, we're coming out. But, oh, don't forget, I have other sheep that don't belong to this. That is us. Other sheep. This is exciting. Jesus is saving the elect that are not of the Jewish fold. That's the greatest thing ever. This should be... Woohoo! Right? I like this. Hosea 23 or 2, 23 says this. This is God talking. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. This is God declaring from way back that Israel, you're not the only one. I'm going to save some people that haven't been called under this covenant or under this whatever or under 
Israel. There's other sheep, what Jesus is saying. It's a wonderful promise that Jesus Christ becomes our good shepherd as Gentiles, as non-Jewish people. We become his sheep the way he planned it. <coughs> Excuse me. The way he planned it from before the foundations of the world. Jeremiah 23, 3. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all of the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. Now, we can look at this two different ways. Well, that's only talking about Israel going back to, you know, Jewish people going back to Israel. No, we're grafted in. We are, we are grafted into all of the promises that God has given. That is the amazing thing. We don't replace anybody. Heaven forbid. We're not, we're not that. But all of the promises, we, we get those things too. That's a great thing. The fifth declaration. The declaration of this shepherd's life okay we've been talking about jesus as the good shepherd well now this is the declaration of him and his life and this is why we're this morning we didn't choose another passage for communion today normally i'll i'll pull our communion from a completely different section that we're going through so that we can focus it all on communion but this morning, that's what this is. This is all about communion. This is all about our good shepherd. Our good shepherd is the reason that we celebrate and take part in communion. So here we enter into the culmination of all of the things that we've talked about this morning. The culmination of everything. The promise of God to save his sheep. The good shepherd, <laughs> the shepherd, the good one, right? That's Jesus coming to fulfill all of those prophecies, all of those promises. The fact that we are owned by God. We are his, the sheep of his, Jesus Christ's pasture. The culmination that the fact of all salvation is only through that one door, only through Christ. That the truth that only in Jesus is true provision, guaranteed, safety, and the assurance of our living hope. That's, that's a great provision right there. And that we as Gentiles are welcomed into that fold. That we are counted as his sheep. So the culmination of all of the things that we've talked about this morning, and now Jesus tells us how all of this, how all of that is possible. In verse 17, for this reason, or I could say for all of those reasons that we just talked about, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. Jesus says that because I am doing this, because of my life, because of a shepherd's life, my willingness to die to redeem the sheep. The father loves me because I am the one who will die that substitutionary death for the sheep. The substitutionary death for his sheep. The atoning sacrifice for the sheep that have wandered all over the place. The shepherd, the good shepherd, is going to be that sacrifice for us, for all of us that have sinned, for all of us that have wandered, for all of us that 
we didn't know until God did something. We just were useless. Isaiah 53, 6 through 7 says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. That, that was his plan from the beginning, from before the foundations of the earth, knowing that his sheep must be redeemed knowing that they needed to be bought back. Jesus was willing to go through all that he endured and willing to lay his life down for that, for that purpose. His life, a shepherd's life, his life had a purpose, a purpose set before him Look how many times in just this, that section, those last two verses that Jesus says, I, I am doing this. I am doing that. That shows his purpose. That shows his intention. So what is a shepherd's life? A shepherd's life is one that serves. It protects it wants the best for the sheep. A faithful shepherd is willing to put his life in between the sheep and danger. Jesus interposes himself between anything that would threaten us eternally and his life. He, 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 he puts himself in between all of that. This is a shepherd's life. A good shepherd would die for his sheep. Let me just say this. A, a shepherd's life is what saved you and me. That is a shepherd's life. Jesus, the good shepherd, went far beyond merely being willing to die for the sheep. Oh, yeah, uh, Sure, I'm willing to do that. He actually, willingly, intentionally laid down his life for them. Laying down his life, the shepherd became the sheep. That's what blows my mind. Laying down his life, the shepherd, the good shepherd. The shepherd, the good one, right? God himself, the I am Good shepherd. The shepherd became the sheep because that's what was required. 1 Peter 1 18 through 19 says, You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your fathers, but with the precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. See, the shepherd became the sheep. He had to become one of us to die to save us. I love that in First Peter here. But by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. See, Jesus is everything. And it's, it's sad sometimes that people don't, Churches, pastors, they don't talk about the blood anymore. Oh, people don't like that. People, that's kind of gory. Talk about the cross. Talk about what Jesus went through. Mm, I don't know. Let's talk about something happy and fluffy and, and pretty. Daisies. Okay? Daisies are nice. I can fit them into a message somehow. No. We're redeemed by the blood of of our God hanging on a cross. <clears throat> Jesus is everything. 
He is the door unto salvation. He is the good shepherd that leads us, the good shepherd that protects us, that provides for us. He is everything. And when we cannot, here's the important part, when we cannot, even at our own death, even at our own death, atone for our own sins, even if if we died for our own sins, that's not enough. Even when we cannot, the good shepherd becomes the lamb that is sacrificed to redeem us. That, that blows me away. Excuse me. By his own volition, Jesus becomes the substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. He lays down his life for his sheep, substituting his life for ours. His life for ours. <laughs> In our text right there, that word for, right? I lay down my life for for the sheep. Sorry, I just totally got lost here. There we go. That word for, that's a major theological preposition. Okay? I have no idea really what a preposition is. I just know that that is one, how they're used. And I'm looking over this direction because I should probably learn this. I just know that that preposition is a major theological preposition. You've heard it said um, that large doors swing on small hinges, right? Large doors swing on small hinges. Well, that's the same in the Bible. Major truths, major truths in the Bible often hinge on the smallest word. Massive theological things, truths, hinge on the smallest word. And that's what we have right here. Four. Four. Jesus became the substitutionary sacrifice for, in place of, so that we didn't have to. All of the stuff for. You see that? Jesus is the only way. He is everything. It's by the good shepherd the good shepherd's life laid down that we have redemption. That's on the other side of the four. He laid down his life for the sheep. On the other side of that little hinge, redemption. The cleansing of sin, reconciliation to the Father, our atonement. Because the shepherd became the propitiation to the Father for us. It was by his blood. And yeah, I like getting that word in there as often as I can. Because that is a very important word for us to understand. By Christ's blood. Hebrews 9.12 says, Not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And today... We remember our good shepherd becoming the lamb. Our good shepherd, our great I am, God incarnate, becoming 
the lamb. The lamb that was sacrificed to take away our sin, your sin, my sin. Laying down his life. Because the shepherd became the sheep. That, that was, that's the propitiation. That's what needed to be sacrificed was him. Go ahead. we think about the good shepherd when we think about Jesus right and we talked about this before Jesus is everything so not only is he the door unto salvation not only is he our salvation by his blood he is like we looked at the good shepherd he is the one that provides provision. He is the one that saves us. He is the one that gives us that eternal living hope. And that eternal living hope is what we cling to. Or I should say, because of that, our shepherd clings to us. And when we could not pay for our own sins... Our good shepherd says, that's okay. I'll cover that too. I will become that as well. Not only the door, not only provision, not only salvation. I will become thank you, the sacrifice. In Luke's gospel, in Luke's gospel, it says, and when he had taken some bread, and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this. Do this in remembrance of me. Expounding on that, do this as you remember your good shepherd becoming the sheep. As you remember the shepherd's life that was given to save your life. This is the representation <laughs> of our good shepherd laying down his life, willingly taking the punishment. The sheep can't pay for it. The sheep can't pay for anything. The sheep can't atone for anything. The sheep are just sheep. But the owner of the sheep... <laughs> The owner, the one who owns the sheep. This represents his life. Given as a ransom for the sheep. Lord, we thank you. We give thanks like you did for all that you have done and are still doing. Help us, Lord, to remember. Let's partake. Well, it's only part. That's only part of this whole thing that we get to do. A shepherd, a shepherd is willing to protect. A shepherd is willing to put his life in between danger and the sheep. Willing to allow his blood to be spilled to save his sheep. And the symbol that we're passing around right now, as you get it, that simple symbol represents shepherd's life voluntarily poured out for you and me. Voluntarily. Jesus says, 
No one can take my life. No one can take it. But I, of my own volition, I will lay down my life for those sheep that I own. For those sheep that know my voice and those sheep that I know them. That when I call them, they say, oh, there's my shepherd. That's my shepherd. It represents a life poured out that saves us. Here's a big one. That shepherd's life that was poured out on that cross represents a life, my life now, saved from wrath. Saved from God's wrath. That's what Jesus did. Jesus took that on himself so that we wouldn't have to. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This cup. That's what this represents. He knows his sheep. His sheep know his voice. And our good shepherd bled and died to save us. And so today we remember and we give thanks. And Lord, we want to follow after you like good sheep. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Let's partake together. Father God, we, we thank you for your perfect plan, the plan of redemption, the plan that you laid before the foundations of the earth to save your sheep, to save those that you own. God, we pray that by your spirit, you would help us not to wander and not to stray, but in our life, in everything, give you glory and just stay close to the shepherd. Help us to stay close, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.